so good evening to all of you so i am going to talk about the speciation studies using txrf technique so these are the topics that i am going to cover during my talk so first of all i will talk about what is called the speciation then i will talk about what are the different analytical challenges that are present for the speciation studies and there are basically two uh, methods that can be employed for the speciation studies one is called the chemical pre concentration method and another is called the by using advanced technique that is called txrf zens technique so i will discuss about both of this method and how this techniques can be used for the speciation studies will be discussed in this talk so as all of you know that speciation is basically the determination of individual concentration of different species of an element that together make up the total concentration of that element so as you can see that in that beaker there is some solution and there are several analytes that are shown by this different colored circles so the speciation study aims not only to identify what are the different types of species of a particular analytes are present but also to determine their individual concentration so both identification of different species as well as determining their individual concentration is the main aim of any speciation studies so the question is why speciation is so much important so it has lots of application in environmental science and also it has huge industrial as well as nuclear applications so in case of environmental study to monitor the chemical toxicity in different types of environmental samples like water soil or aerosol particle species and is utmost important now as an example we all know that chromium is basically a naturally occurring element that can be found in different types of uh, environmental samples like water food soil rocks etc now few uh, microgram of chromium 3 is basically act as a micronutrients however on the other hand there is another species that is called chromium 6 which is 100 to 1000 time more toxic than the chromium plus 3 and there is a who recommended limit that is a chromium 6 in water sample that is 0.1 microgram per ml so to uh, estimate what is the uh, actual concentration of chromium in different types of environmental samples and to determine which species uh, present in those sample species and studies is at most important on the other hand uh, arsenic also uh, exists in different types of organic form as well as inorganic form but among all those species arsenic 3 is the most dangerous or most toxic species on the other hand we all know that few my uh, few amount of selenium is very important for our body and during that covid-19 pandemic it was seen that in the covid-19 affected patients those patients which are having more selenium concentration in their blood streams are having higher immunity on the other hand if we uptake more concentration of selenium in our body it will become toxic or poison for all of us on the other hand selenium can Uh, present in different species or different forms and among them selenium 4 is the most toxic one so not only uh, determination of concentration is important but also to identify their uh, different form of the species is also very important so that's why speciation study is very important for environmental science so there are many analytical challenge that are present for speciation studies the first of them is the most of the time during that speciation the species are not stable and get converted into other form so during that speciation study we have to take in care that the species should not change from one form to another it should remain stable throughout the speciation study on the other hand there are several factors like ph of the medium presence of other interfering ions temperature etc all uh, can affect the speciation study and we have to carefully optimize the condition during the speciation and there is we all know that as we are doing speciation study in different types of environmental samples so it also possesses large amount of matrix so in presence of large amount of matrix we have to do speciation at ppb or ppm level which is also a very challenging task on the other hand 
there can be a several spectral interference that can be present, which can also affect the speciation study. So these are different analytical challenges that are present while doing the speciation studies. So any ideal technique for speciation studies should be simple as well as cost effective. On the other hand, it should have less spectral interference. It should require minimum sample preparation. And on the uh, last but not the least, it should have very high sensitivity or low detection limit. So we could do the speciation at ultra trace level. And it was seen that TXRF technique satisfies all this criteria. So that's why nowadays TXRF technique has been routinely used for the speciation studies of different types of environmental samples. So there are basically two different analytical approach that could be used for the speciation studies. So the first approach is called the chemical separation or pre-concentration followed by TXRF. So from the name, you can see that in this method, we actually pre-concentrate a particular species. So in that process, we do not require any synchrotron facility. We can use only lab-based TXRF for that study. And as we are pre-concentrating the analytes, so this method can be used for the speciation of those analytes which are present at very low concentration level, that is down to few ppb. On the other hand, there is another advanced technique that is present for the speciation studies that is called the TXRF genes technique. Now, as this TXRF genes technique requires some uh, uh, synchrotron-based energy source, and, but there are so many advantages of this technique. The first advantage is that it requires less sample preparation. It's very simple technique, and we could actually directly determine the different species and their concentration present in the sample. And it could also do the speciation of different types of solid particles. So both these two techniques has their own advantages as well as disadvantages. So we have to judiciously choose which technique we actually require. So in this talk, I am going to talk about both the technique that uh, I have all both used both the technique for the speciation study, and I will discuss both of them in this talk. So the first I am going to talk about the speciation of arsenic at ultra trace level by TXRF using chemical preconcentration method. So as all of you aware that uh, arsenic contamination in groundwater is a worldwide problem. So in that map. As you can see that the, in different countries, there is a severe concentration of arsenic in groundwater. So that's why determination of arsenic as well as speciation of arsenic is a worldwide problem. Now, the question naturally occurred that why there are so much concentration of arsenic in groundwater? So there are basically three types of sources which actually add arsenic in groundwater sample. And in three of them, the most important source is called the geogenic source. So in what happened that in the earth crust, there are 200 minerals that are present, which contain arsenic. So during that weathering of these types of rocks and minerals, those rocks and minerals containing arsenic getting dissolved, and they finally come in contact with groundwater. On the other hand, during that volcanic eruption also, these minerals also come in contact with the water and they finally dissolved and increase the concentration of arsenic in groundwater. There is another source that is called the biogenic source. So there are many aquatic animals and also microorganisms which also increase the concentration of organic arsenic in waters. And there is another source that is called man-made source or anthropogenic source. And among them, we all know that in, in, in agriculture, we use several fertilizer and pesticides that contain arsenic. And these arsenic finally goes into the groundwater. On the other hand, in industry, we use different types of chemicals in different industry. And those chemicals contain toxic arsenic, which finally goes into the groundwater. And during that municipal waste uh, disposal, during that mining or metal smelting also increase the arsenic concentration in groundwater. So all these factors cumulatively increase the concentration of arsenic in groundwater. So these are the disease that could be caused if, uh, if anyone take excess arsenic through the drinking water. So to avoid this thing, 
it is utmost important to do the uh, uh, speciation as well as determination of arsenic at ultra trace level. So WHO has recommended that the arsenic in drinking water should be less than 5 ppb. So we have to develop such speciation method for arsenic, which could do the speciation at so con low concentration level. Now, as you can see in this uh, figure, arsenic is present in these types of different species. So these are the organic form of arsenic. And these two are the inorganic form of arsenic. Now, among these two inorganic form of arsenic, arsenic-3 is the most toxic one. Now, in this work, I have developed a, a novel absorbent that is called N-methyl D-glucomine, and I have functionalized this uh, absorbent on the quad sample support, and I have used this novel absorbent for the speciation of arsenic in different type of water samples. So these are the different steps that has been carried out during that immobilization of that NMDG membrane on the, on the quartz sample support. So this NMDG is the extractant which actually absorbs the arsenic. So first step is the surface oxidation. So this surface oxidation of quartz sample support has been carried out using piranha solution. So this is not the piranha. Piranha is actually this three is to one mixture of sulfuric acid and 30% hydrogen peroxide. So it is a strong oxidizing agent, which actually oxidize the quad sample support. So what we do that we have prepared this Piranha solution and we have preheated this Piranha solution to 80 degrees centigrade. And we have dipped these quad sample supports into this Piranha solution for 30 minutes. And after that, we have taken out this quad sample support and uh, rinsed it with milky water, then finally with the treatment with ethanol, these types of quad sample supports are oxidized and these types of SIOH groups are attached on the quad sample supports. Now in the second step that is called the silanization of the quad sample support, we, we, uh, we have added two microliter of this compound that is called 3 glyoxidioxopropyl trimethoxy silane. So this is one type of silane compound that is being attached via internal gelation reaction where 0.1 molar nitric acid has been used as an acid catalyst. So during that internal gelation reaction, this silane has been attached to the quartz surface. And in the step three, that is called the immobilization of NMDG, we, uh, we are adding four microliter of the 1% NM, NMDG that is dissolved in DMF at 80 degrees centigrade. And in that condition, there is a one type of in-situ ring opening reaction. And through these types of reaction, NMDG, NMDG finally attached with the quad sample support. So this types of structure has been formed and it looks like a thin membrane. So as you can see that after immobilization of the NMDG, the quad sample supports are looking like this. So a very thin film or membrane type of thing has been formed and the TXRF condition is retained. And this NMDG membrane basically acts as a solid phase extractant for the speciation studies using pre-concentration method. Now, as all we know that in TXRF, we need some type of internal standard because if we use internal, if there is any uh, change in the counting statistics due to the uh, change in, on the surface morphology of that membrane, or due to the change in the calibration of the instrument or due to geometric factor, all these things can change the count rate. But if we use some internal standard, all these things will be taken care. So that's why uh, it is very important to use some kinds of internal standard during TXRF measurement. So in this work, I have developed a very novel way of introducing internal standard. So what I have done, I have taken 50 ml solution of chlorooric acid in a beaker where uh, having gold concentration of 50 ppb. And in that solution, I have dipped the quad support having NMDG immobilized on it. And after two hours, you can see that there are so many hydroxyl groups are present in the NMDG. So this hydroxyl group basically act as a reducing agent and it will reduce this gold that is present in plus three form. And this gold plus three will be reduced to AU0. And this gold will be absorbed on the NMDG membrane in form of a nanoparticles. So this gold will act like an internal standard. 
Now, this is the absorption spectra of that gold loaded NMDG membrane. And as you can see that there is a, a sharp peak at around 500 to 600 nanometer, which shows the presence of gold nanoparticle because this sharp peak arises due to the surface plasmon resonance that is occurring due to the formation of gold nanoparticle. On the other hand, this picture is basically the FESM image of that NMDG surface before gold loading. And in the, this picture is basically the same FESM image of that same membrane after the gold loading. So you can see that after loading of gold as a nanoparticle, this gold has been distributed throughout the NMDG membrane very homogeneously. And I have also uh, determined the uh, particle size distribution of that gold nanoparticle. And it was, see, it was seen that the size distribution is around 10 to 25 nanometer. So both this FESM image as well as absorption spectra clearly suggest that whatever the gold that is trapped inside that NMDG membrane is in the form of nanoparticle, which we are going to use as an internal standard. So this is the TXRF spectra of a gold loaded membrane. So you can clearly see the gold L alpha and gold L beta P. Now, as we know that this NMDG membrane is very selectively bind with arsenic five species, but we have to determine both arsenic three as well as arsenic five. So that's why uh, I have developed one strategy. So first of all, I have just determine arsenic-5 concentration by simply dipping this NMDG immobilized uh, quartz sample support into the unknown solution that has to be determined. And after determining the arsenic-5 concentration, I have taken another solution, same solution. But in that case, as the solution contains both arsenic plus 3 as well as arsenic plus 5, uh, I have used 200 microliter of H2O2. And under studying condition, all the arsenic-3 present in the solution will be converted into arsenic-5. So now in that solution, whatever the arsenic present will be in the form of arsenic-5. So now in the solution also, I have determined the total arsenic concentration. So in first step, I have uh, uh, determined the arsenic-5 concentration. And in the second step, I have determined total arsenic concentration. And now the arsenic-3 concentration can be simply determined by subtracting the arsenic-5 concentration from the total arsenic concentration. So this is the strategy that I have used for the speciation of arsenic using this technique. Now, there are several uh, factors that could actually affect the uh, uh, sorption of arsenic-5 species into the NMDG membrane. And the first and utmost factor is called the pH of the medium. So it was seen that around pH six to seven, the membrane has highest arsenic five uptake efficiency. And after that, as you can see that the uptake of arsenic five steadily decreases. Now in this picture, you can see that this in this NMDG membrane, the arsenic five species basically attached via this type of electrostatic interaction. So you can see that there is a ternary amine which is having a positive charge and this arsenate is having a negative charge. So there is a type of electrostatic interaction which actually binds the arsenic-5 species. But what happened after pH uh, 7 is that this ternary amine get deprotonated. So as there is no positive charge, as this ternary amine gets deprotonated, so after pH 7, these types of electrostatic interaction uh, steadily decreases which actually reduces the arsenic-5 uptake efficiency. So you can see after pH 7, the ratio of arsenic K alpha by gold L alpha ratio steadily decreases. Similarly, we have also uh, see the effect of sample volume on arsenic-5 absorption by the NMDG membrane. And it was seen that uh, 50 ml volume is the optimum volume, which will give the very good detection limit for that study. So you can see that this is the TXRS spectra of a 20 ppb arsenic solution before pre-concentration and after pre-concentration. So you can see that this red color spectra that is before pre-concentration, we hardly see any peak of arsenic. But you can see that after doing this pre-concentration, there is how much improvement uh, uh, in the counting statistics. And also we have determined the detection limit 
before pre concentration and after pre concentration and there is almost 140 times improvement uh, of detection limit using this methodology so you can see that the, this is a spectra of an arsenic 5 solution containing 0.3 ppb arsenic so you can see still although arsenic is present at such low concentration level still we can see the peak of arsenic alpha so using this methodology we could do the speciation study at such low concentration level so after optimizing all these parameter i have uh, finally prepared the calibration curve so the calibration curve is prepared by putting the ratio of arsenic k alpha by gold l alpha so this gold is basically acting as an internal standard and in the x axis axis i have put the arsenic 5 concentration so i have uh, i get a very linear uh, curve and by using the equation of that curve i i have determined the arsenic 5 concentration in different unknown solution so i have spiked different amount of arsenic 3 and arsenic 5 species in different some unknown solution and determine their concentration and it could be seen that by using this methodology we could determine both arsenic 3 and arsenic 5 with very high accuracy and with high precision similarly i have also done the speciation study using the same methodology in groundwater sample as well as tap water sample where uh, some known amount of arsenic 3 and arsenic 5 are spiked separately and in that case also the result is very satisfactory so the method that is being developed is very simple we could use lab based pxrf source for the speciation study you do not require any synchrotron based facility the technique is fast it hardly require four to five hours to complete the speciation uh, procedure and it is much more cost effective all those chemicals are uh, very cheap so it is very much cost effective and the most important thing is that by using this technique we could achieve a detection limit as low as 0 0.05 ppb so we could do the uh, speciation at ultra trace level using this methodology so as i have told you that speciation study is very important in the nuclear industry also so in nuclear industry uranium oxide is a very important fuel that is used in the fuel rod and you can see this is the structure of uranium oxide that is fluoride type structure now upon oxidation this uranium oxide being converted into this types of mixed valent oxide so what is called mixed valent oxide is that in this types of mixed valent oxide uranium is present in more than one oxidation state now in this mixed valent oxides are having very interesting magnetic as well as catalytic property and the magnetic and catalytic properties solely depending upon the oxidation state of uranium so to understand their magnetic as well as catalytic properties it is very important to determine the speciation of uranium in these types of mixed valent uranium oxides now you could see that in case of u3 there can be two types of combination that is being possible so in case of u3 uranium could be in the plus 6 and plus 5 state or it could be in plus six and plus four state but we don't right now we don't know that which is the uh, actual combination that is being present there are so many debate that uh, in some paper it is shown that uranium is present in uranium plus four plus six and there are uh, very few reports where it is shown that it is present in plus five and plus six so we thought that this is a very nice and interesting problem that we could choose so that's why uh, I have choose these types of mixed valent uranium oxide. Now there are several techniques that is already available for the speciation of uranium. So one of the important technique is called XPS technique. This XPS technique is a very renowned technique for the speciation studies. However, in case of uranium, uh, what happened that in case of uranium, the four F lines of uraniums are very close to each other for different oxidation states. So there is very less chemical shift for the main uranium 4F line. So that's why by using XPS, determine a speciation study of uranium is very difficult. There is another excellent technique that is used for the speciation study is called synchrotron based Zenz technique. Now in normal Zenz, generally the sample is required in the form of pellet. And in that case, we require sample in milligram level. However, this technique is not so much useful when we are handling very precious 
element or some radioactive element because in that case we cannot able to handle such huge amount of sample that is the milligram level so in that case we require such a technique which uh, hand we, which can do the speciation uh, by taking sample few microgram or few nanogram and we all know that txrf technique require very small amount of sample so that's why if you uh, if one can combine this txrf technique with genes that will be an excellent technique for the speciation of these types of highly precise or precious material as well as highly radioactive material so that that's why i have carried out one work where i have done the direct determination of oxidation state of uranium in different types of mixed valent uranium oxide using txrf genes technique now, uh, uh, people, uh, there are uh, very few report in the literature where TXRF change technique has been used. So there is one report I have seen where Strali at uh, Christiana Madam has done some work, but she has used this TXRF technique for the speciation of arsenic in uh, some types of cucumber xylem sa sample. But there is not any single report where TXRF genes technique has been utilized for the speciation of different types of radioactive or nuclear fuel samples. So that's why I thought this problem could be very interesting. So the main or the major advantages of the, using TXRF genes technique is that the sample preparation is very simple. So what we do during the TXRF genes sample preparation, we take few amount of few microgram of that sample and we touch this sample with a tip and then we touch this tip on the center of that quartz sample support so few microgram or few nanogram sample will be sticked on the center of the sample support and that sample is sufficient to give good counting statistics so we could do the txrf genes measurement so you could see that there is almost negligible sample preparation involved during that txrf genes on the other hand, the sample oxidation state remains unchanged. As we are doing minimum sample preparation, so there is no chance that the sample could get oxidized. And as the very small amount of sample is required, uh, roughly few micrograms to few nanograms, this types of methodology is very important to determine uh, for the speciation studies of highly radioactive materials. So all these uh, speciation studies uh, of uran mixed valent uranium oxide has been done uh, at INDAS2 microfocus beamline RRK at Indore. So as you can see, this is the arrangement uh, of that beamline, uh, microfocus beamline, where through, through this direction, the beam is falling uh, through this slit and finally onto that uh, sample support, which in the, and the center of the sample support, we have deposited the sample. And after that, it is getting totally reflected. And at 90 degree angle, there is a SDT detector which detects the signal. So we have used two ionization chamber and the James measurement can be carried out in two mode. One is called the transmission mode and another is called the fluorescence mode. So we have uh, used fluorescence mode for the speciation study. So in James measurement, we are basically interested uh, in the in this region that is plus minus 50 ev around the edge positions so as you can see this is the txrf spectra of u308 that is recorded for 10 second time so you can see that only 10 second is sufficient to give a very good count for uranium l alpha and this uranium l alpha is chosen as the region of interest or the roi and this is the normalized txrf gen spectra where in the y, y axis, that is the normalized mu E, and in the x axis, that is the energy that we have uh, changed during that uh, experiment. So you can see that this is the TXRF gen spectra of different compounds like uranium oxide, tellium uranate, U308, and UO3. Now, uh, during that uh, TXRF uh, speciation, we need some standards of uranium. Like in case of uranium oxide, it is basically standards of uranium as uranium plus four. On the other hand, tellium uranate basically act as a standard for uranium plus five. And UO3 act as a standard for uranium plus six. So these standards are required for speciation studies using TXRF genes technique. Sorry. So you can see that as you are going from plus four to plus six, 
from uranium oxide to uh, UO3, the H position is changing from the lower energy to higher energy. And this is because as the oxidation state of uranium increases, it requires la uh, more, more energy to knock out the inertial electrons from the uranium atom. So that's why the H position is shifting from the lower energy to higher energy. And if you see the H position of uranium in case of U3O8, it is situated in between plus five and plus six. Now to exactly determine the H position, we have to take the first derivative of this gen spectrum. So this is the first derivative of that gen spectrum and from the peak of this uh, spec uh, of this curve, we could get the H position. So you can see these are the H positions of these compounds along with U308. So you can see that U308 H position is situated around uranium plus five and uranium plus six, which gives us the initial expression that this U308 uranium could be in plus five and plus six state. But to get confirmed, we have to do the linear least square fitting process, which has been done using a software that is called Athena. So in Athena, we actually take the TXRF gen spectra of various reference sample that is uranium oxide, uh, uh, tallium uranate UO3. These are basically standards of uranium. So we, uh, we are taking the uh, these standard compound and we are using different linear combination of this, uh, their spec TXRF gen spectra to finally generate one spectra. And we will try to fit the our actual spectra with this linear combination spectra. So during that Athena, uh, during use of Athena or using this least square linear combination fitting, we should have a very good quality of spectra. So you can see that this is the interface of that Athena software. Uh, the red color is the fitted linear combination fitted spectra. And this blue color is the actual spectra. So in case of U308, as you can see, we have tried both combination. We have tried both uranium four, six combination as well as uranium five and six combination. And this red colors uh, TXRF genes is the basically uh, the fitted spectra. So you can see that if we take the combination of uranium plus four and plus six, uh, the spectra do not fitting fitted well. However, if we take the combination of plus five and plus six, it is very well, much well fitted. And after fitting, not only Athena software can fit and also tell the combination, but also Athena software can identify or determine what is the percentage of different species that is being present. So by fitting this spectra, it was seen that in U308 uranium is basically present in uranium plus five and plus six, where it has having 70% uranium plus five and 30% uranium plus six. And this data is also agrees with the theoretically predicted value that is 66 and 34%. So previously many people thought that U308 basically composed of uranium plus four and plus six, but um, our study, as well as there is one study that has been reported in uh, PRL, uh, proves that in U308 uranium is basically present in uranium plus five and plus six. So this is the work that has been carried out. And same thing has been done for these types of mixed valent uranium oxide, that is U307. And it was seen that in case of U307, uranium is present as uranium plus four and plus six. So it was seen that TXRF technique can be used for the speciation of different types of toxic elements like chromium, arsenic, antimony, selenium, and different types of environmental samples. So directive selective sorption type of study can be carried out for those elements which are present in natural water sample at ultra trace level. On the other hand, if we require speciation study of very highly precious material or very highly radioactive material, where minimum sample preparation is required. In that case, TXRF GENS technique is an excellent technique. So there are many more opportunities to exploit this TXRF GENS technique for the species and study of different types of samples. So these are the lab members. So all this work has been carried out under the supervision of Dr. NL Misra. And these are the lab members. And I would also like to acknowledge my team member, co-authors, collaborators, 
and colleagues. And I would uh, uh, especially like to acknowledge Dr. M. K. Tewari for providing us the beam time at Indus 2 BL16 RRCAT Indoor. And I would also like to thank Enforce TXRF to give me the opportunity to present my work in front of this uh, such learned audience. So thank you very much for your uh, kind attention. And you can ask question if you want. Thank you. Thank you so much for the excellent talk. I think everyone enjoyed it very much. Yeah, give you a hand first. It's always difficult online. And the talk is open for discussion. Uh, I see a hand from Eva. Eva, please go ahead. Okay, now I think that it's fine, the microphone. Okay, so first I want to, to thank and congratulate the speaker because the, the, the presentation was really interesting. And uh, I want to ask you uh, regarding the reuse of the, um, the quartz reflectors that you, um, you talk in the first part of your oral presentation. So it, mm -hmm. is it possible to reuse them or you need to clean and then to, to put again all the regions or what? Okay, okay. So uh, after using this quad sample support, we have to dip all those supports into highly concentrated nitric acid for at least two to three hours. And after mm -hmm. that, we have uh, it is simply in through by using tissue paper. So it can be easily reusable, these quad sample supports. That is no okay, problem. so the, sur the surface is not damaged. I mean, it's... Uh... Not at all, not at all. Oh, okay, okay, okay. This is nice. <laughs> okay, thank you. So I have a comment from Nand, which says, nice and interesting presentation. Are there more questions? Otherwise, I have a question. So you used the gold nanoparticles to um, quantify. I was wondering if you pipetted always the same amount of the ligands uh, to bond to the surface, would you even need that? Yeah, <laughs> what happened that uh, during that TXRF measurement, the membrane is not always situated at the center and the uh, surface morphology. Sometimes the surface morphology also affect the sorption efficiency of arsenic five. So all this effect will be taken care if we use gold as an internal standard. And sometimes what happened that the membrane is not slightly at the center, it is slightly uh, one side. So if the uh, intensity of arsenic five for that reason uh, is low, at the same time, will gold L alpha intensity will also be low, so that's why it will nullify all those factors which could actually uh, change the counting statistics. So that's why it is better to use some kinds of internal standard. And there are many methods that has been already reported where this types of membrane-based technique has been used for the pre-concentration of elements like chromium. I think one work has been done by. Uh, uh, for the chromium species and they have prepared the calibration curve without using any internal standard. That method can also be done, but this will add, uh, this will add more, more caution or more, we can say, uh, accurate thing because the counting statistics, even though it will may change, but it will not affect the result. Okay, yeah, yeah, I see that. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Uh, may I ask? Yes, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, you use uh, synchrotron, synchrotron radiation facility. So in such case, uh, uh, I'm afraid the red PB background sometimes uh, red. Which background? Which background it's a red. It's a PB. Uh, lead, lead. Lead. Okay, okay. Yes, okay. yes. Red uh, okay. Uh, background sometimes mm -hmm. interfere the, the arsenic peak. Okay. So are there any something, some kind of results? So no, no need to, to worry about that. Sir, it's actually, I haven't done the arsenic speciation using PXRF genes. I have done the speciation uh, of different types of mixed valent uranium using PXRF genes. But yes, for arsenic, lead background can definitely affect, uh, affect but I haven't done that TXRF genes using uh, synchrotron, so I cannot comment on that actually. Okay. I have Thank used uh, arsenic speciation using pre-concentration methodology. Uh, mm -hmm. Lead may be present, but 
in that case uh, as i have told you that the interaction is uh, solely electrostatic interaction where the arsenate species is being absorbed on the nmdg membrane but in case of lead as it is present in the neutral species i do not think that it will be uh, also absorbed by the nmdg membrane so that interference will not occur in if we use pre concentration based method using nmdg membrane and uh, if if we want to measure the the red using synchrotron uh, txrf uh, mm -hmm. Is it possible to use uh, the selective uh, excitation? Yes, method? yes, yes. Uh, the one one of my co uh, worker Dr. Sangeeta Dharalenka, has already reported one work where uh, she has selectively excited uh, lead uh, in presence of arsenic using synchrotron radiation, and that is absolutely possible. And that work is already published in some paper. So this mm -hmm. is this is that was uranium and rubidium, Kaushik. Okay, sorry, but it could be possible. Oh, one word. Sorry, I forgot that. Yes, but definitely it is possible. Yes, yes. if we select, yeah. but we have to see what is the energy difference between this arsenic and lead and absorption edge. We have to absorption see absorption edge. edge. Yes, yes, that is definitely possible. Thank you. Are there more questions? So maybe I have a question to the access to the synchrotron. How easy is it for you to get beam time? It is very easy. There is some uh, interface uh, where I, we have to register in that interface and we have to apply for that beam time. And they easily give us the beam time. And in that step, uh, time, we have to go there. And right during that this COVID pandemic, it is right now, it is difficult. But mm -hmm. before that pre-pandemic time, it is it was uh, pretty easy to get the mm -hmm. beam time. Yeah, that's nice. That's nice. So then you can um, do all those studies. Um, this is like this beam, beam is maintained by Dr. Beam line is maintained by Dr. M. K. Tewari. Mm -hmm. And right now there is also a facility that is vacuum in the in presence of vacuum atmosphere. They have also developed vacuum atmosphere. So now we can measure uh, TXRF in of low jet elements also. Nice. Thank you. In fact, I have uh, one comment, not question, that uh, first of all, I would like to con congratulate Kosik for nice presentation. And by his talk, we can see that uh, TXRF speciation is very much useful for those samples where sample amount are in light is very, very small quantity, like nuclear, forensic, archaeological, biological, and especially for heavy elements. So, so in force TXRF, we should uh, concentrate on these type of samples for speciation of heavy elements. Uh, another possibility is that uh, this speciation may be non-destructive also. Like uh, you take a plate of uh, some work we have done on the Jirkulva and Jirkunium Nivimala plates. For analysis, we have done, but same way we can do speciation. And, uh, Non-destruction of the sample and non-consumption of sample is a very good feature of TXRF, which can surpass for all other techniques available for such work. Thank you very much. None. Thank you very much for the comment. That is very, very true. I see another question from Giacomo. I, Please go uh, ahead. Yeah. Hi. Um, very nice presentation. I have a question about the the detector, which which detector did you use for measurements? Well, which, uh, synchrotron. synchrotron. In synchrotron, we are using SDT silicon trip detectors. SDT detector. Oh, can you can you also tell us which uh, which manufacturer? Which manufacturer? I'm I mean, not sure, but maybe it is Ketek. I'm not so no, much no, sure no. about it. Okay, I understand. Maybe Ketek. I'm not 100% sure, but it may be Ketek. Uh, what, what about the um, blank measurements of your reflectors? I, I was just wondering if you have uh, uh, some signals in your, in your blank uh, reflectors. Do you have any of them? Apart, of course, silicon and so on. 
actually uh, you can say, if you see the spectra uh, what uh, we have measured the txrf gen spectra at mm. each age at each age we have measured for two second uh, or uh, sorry for four second and in that uh, four second uranium as it is a heavy metal it has very high fluorescence intensity so i do not think any background radiation can affect uh, that thing, that ROI portion. And what so, about arsenic? Uh, yes, yes, yes. For arsenic, we have measured the background because uh, you, uh, uh, there is one table where I have uh, haven't added anything. Like I haven't added anything and just dipped the uh, sample support that is immobilized with D, uh, NMDG and it was measured, but we haven't seen any arsenic five. But there is few background uh, counts for uh, elements like potassium, calcium, zinc. These are uh, the background elements that is present in that. But it uh, do not affect the result for that arsenic speciation. No. Understand. Great. Thank you. Very much. Background will always present, but in TXRF, as we know that the, due to the total deflection condition, the background is very low. And yes, in presence of membrane, there will be enhancement, slightly enha enhancement of the background because uh, we are using some kinds of membrane, but still, if you see the spectra, it was not so much severe. That background interference is not so much severe if you see the spectra. Okay, I understand that because I know this as, as well. Yeah. And also, I, the film is very thin. Uh, yeah. I haven't measured the thickness, but it is. If you, see, I have shown you in the picture, it is very thin. So the TXRF condition is totally retained due to the formation of these kinds of thin films. So the background will be very low. Okay, I understand. Okay. And so even for, you have no, you have a very limited contamination from, I don't know, for example, nickel or uh, iron and so on. Yes, there is uh, some uh, background towns for nickel, iron. Yes, of course, but that do not affect that arsenic speciation. No, no, there uh, is, of course, yeah. there is some contamination because I have also analyzed groundwater and uh, tap water samples. In that uh, samples, nickel, iron, these are generally present in the, those samples. But those samples were not uptaken by that NMDG memory. It is very much selective for arsenic-5 only. So, in, in normal cases, we have some uh, in this background of nickel, iron, calcium, but that is very, very small. And we take care of, of the sample protection. So that is not affecting our result in normal condition. Even in this speciation, that it will not affect because he's measuring arsenic. Okay, that's clear. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there more questions? I do not see more questions. So let's thank Kauchik again. Shortly share my screen to announce the next journal club, which I already announced at the beginning, which will be given by Dr. Janos Rosan, Senior Research Fellow at the Environmental Physics Department in Budapest, Hungary. Then I have not more to do. Yeah, then to, to wish you already a nice weekend and uh, see you again on October the 28th uh, for the talk of Janosch.